Now, the Webbs were interesting people because Sidney Webb was such a bureaucrat. He used to put uh, the members of the Fabian Society to a hypnotic trance and a sleep, a deep coma almost, with his bureaucraties. He had a special language of his own, which he was cultivating for all bureaucrats. We're all familiar with some of it today because it's mentioned over television news stations uh, quite frequently. Um, they actually do talk about, like that amongst themselves, by the way. But uh, the webs led off uh, what appeared to be this, this great left-wing labor or organization to get the, the herd, as they called the people, uh, moving into the next stage, a scientific era, you see, a technological age. And uh, that was their job, was to, to con them and, and to, to get them to come along willingly, thinking it was all on their behalf. So uh, here's a statement from Bertrand Russell's autobiography about the webs themselves, just to let you know where these people really had their mind. He said, he said on page 115 of the autobiography of Bertrand Russell, it says, both of them, the Webbs, were fundamentally undemocratic and regarded it as a function of a statesman to bamboozle or terrorize the populace. I realized the origins of Mrs. Webb's conceptions of government when she repeated to me her father's description of shareholders' meetings. It is the recognized function of directors to keep shareholders in their place. And she had a similar view about the relation of the government to the electorate. So that's the kind of, of people who led, and still do, by the way, the Labour Party. It's a, it's a con job over the, the working people because they've never had one of their own in the top, never, and it never will happen. Their leaders are always supplied to them. Uh, she goes on to talk about uh, her father, uh, Beatrice Webb, her father's stories of his career had not given her any undue respect for the great. After he had built huts for the winter quarters of the French armies in the Crimea, he went to Paris to get paid. And from then, of course, he talks about him putting up uh, the huts and so on, as I said before, in the destroyed areas across the planet. He was the Halliburton of, of his day. He had all the contracts from governments. And that's where the Potter family uh, obtained the, the masses of their wealth. Uh, so these characters were anything but working class. Um, Bertrand Russell also mentions uh, uh, that, that they hated Ramsay MacDonald, who was the front man for the Labour Party. They had, they had nothing in common with him since they came from the, an upper class, and they were rather hostile to him since he was uncouth and unlearned, etc. In other words, the, the web were incredibly snobbish, which uh, which is a very common in Britain, um, even the accent gives away your, your education and your, 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 your state. You actually, it's not just your state of birth or level of birth, it, it's a caste system. It's, it's, it has so much in common with India because Britain, England, has a caste system pretty well identical to that of India. And it may be one day we'll find out that, that the high Brahmins of India um, are the same bloodlines of those that run Britain, and I would be in the least surprised if that's the case. So, so Bertrand Russell, uh, the Webbs, uh, H.G. Wells, uh, and Wells tried to take over the Fabian Society at one point, and, and uh, the Webbs put him back in his place. Uh, uh, Wells was a, a manic depressive himself, um, and he, he played with drugs, etc. He had he had the usual upper class problems with with uh, sexual relations. He had to have his wives, uh, he had different wives, and they had to sign contracts that they would do certain things for him in a sexual manner, and, and promise to keep their mouths shut if they ever got divorced. So uh, no doubt he had various fetishes and. And perhaps he, when, when his wife was beating him with the whip, maybe he, he, he thought of the working classes getting beaten. Who knows? Something turned him, this strange man, on. So we have this, these types of characters running the left and the right wing. Now, people who want to read 
uh, uh, the autobiography of Bertrand Russell should think for themselves as they read it. Um, remember, there's much more information about, uh, well, about um, uh, Bertrand Russell than his own autobiography. You'll find another book. It's called, it's called, uh, this particular one is called In the Minds of Men, excellent book. Uh, the subtitle is Darwin and the New World Order. And that was, that was written by Ian Taylor, who's a scientist in Canada. And he goes through much more of, of these particular characters who changed society, changed history, uh, created the fads that became thought as, as, as reality, like Darwinianism. Um, he says, in fact, in his own book, this one here, uh, in the Minds of Men, uh, commenting on Bertrand Russell, he said, uh, he said Margaret Mead, uh, Margaret Mead, of course, was put out there to, to push for abortion and, and, and so, so on. And actually, she was, she was, she was more than just an abortionist. She wanted to also start uh, sterilization processes, much like Margaret Sanger had done uh, before her, uh, for, for the mentally unfit, as they called them. And of course, once they have an IQ level, which they claim is appropriate, and everybody says that's, that's fine, I'm, I'm above that. Well, of course, like every other law they have in the book, they then change it and expand it. And that uh, would have been a horror show if that this had come to pass. But uh, Mead became uh, the darling instead of humanists such as Bertrand Russell um, in 1929. And Havelock Ellis, who cited her work often to promote their own ideas of sexual liberation, because this uh, free sex is what they called it, free love, was started in the 1800s by these, these same aristocratic people that they wanted the people to emulate. Uh, they wanted to destroy the family unit. In fact, the family unit was the last vestige of, of um, power which would stand up collectively against uh, uh, too much intrusion by an elite. And so it had to, the family had to go. Once that was destroyed, then the state became supreme ruler directly to the individual, which we see today. Uh, m many women now, uh, probably over half, have uh, are single parent families, and there's generally social workers from the state uh, involved in their lives all the time, concerning the rearing of their children or removing of their children, and this again. Is, uh, was planned and discussed freely by guys like Bertrand Russell back in the 1800s, um, uh, Margaret Mead and, and Havelock Ellis and so on. Um, so this, this, is, this, is, this is a big, rich club, you see, of, of rich elitists. Um, in Darwin and the Minds of Men, it says uh, Mead and Benjamin Spock um, between, between them. The pattern of North American child rearing was radically changed, and the fruits of their labors are now becoming evident in today's divorce statistics. Mead's own modest contribution to these statistics consisted of having three husbands, uh, which would seem to refute the promise of a happy and graceful life she claimed science showed to be possible with a liberated sexual lifestyle. Ironically, for both science and alleged happy life, Mead one of American's leading scientists and a, purport, a purported Christian died in 1978 in the arms of a psychic faith healer. So another little clue that pops in down through the ages with reading all these guys is they're all Masons or Eastern stars for the females. They all believe in the same um, channeling experiences from entities, uh, and, and they, they, they front for a Christian organizations. That's their cover. Uh, Bertrand Russell espoused the total Masonic doctrine of evolution and great purpose behind it, meaning a great power, the grand architect of the universe. And, and Mead was into the uh, fortune telling and, and palm reading and um, and channeling, of course. So these are the these are these are the, the heroes who helped change society, which they claimed for the was for the better. So. Let's go back to another book of Bertrand Russell, and this one is called uh, The Impact of Science on Society. Um, 
this was a, a, a treatise really on population control on one level, and it was also a treatise on uh, methods of, of creating population control. Uh, what I read here, and this book was initially written or published, I believe, in, let me see, 1952. Uh, this, this now is, is, is a good part of what became known as the, the Earth Charter that Maurice Strong put forward. And, of course, it was one of the, the Rockefellers who actually wrote it for Maurice Strong. But in reality, Bertrand Russell put all this stuff down in the 1950s. He said, um, let us now bring together the conclusions which result from an inquiry into the various kinds of conditions that a scientific society must fulfill if it is to be stable. Now, he's talking about a society controlled by scientists, a world run by experts. He says, first, as regards uh, physical conditions, soil and raw materials must not be used up so fast that scientific progress cannot continually make good the loss by means of new inventions and discovering. Scientific progress is therefore a condition, not merely of social progress, but even of maintaining the degree of prosperity already achieved. Given a stationary technique, the raw materials that it requires will be used up in no very long time. If raw materials are not to be used up too fast, there must not be free competition for their acquisition and use, but an international authority to ration them in such quantities as may from time to time seem compatible with continued industrial prosperity. And similar conditions apply to soil, con soil conservation. Now here, that which got written into the Earth Charter and then into the Agenda 21 from the UN Charter, um, and, and now we find out that Bertrand Russell's writing it in the 1950s, and if you go back to, to his friend that he mentions earlier, um, his, his, his particular... Uh, friendship with, um, let me see here, uh, John Stuart Mills, the economist in the 1800s. This is the same thing. It's just reiterated over and over again. They had the plan made up in the 1800s to do exactly that's what they're talking about here. Um, uh, he goes on in the uh, impact of science on society, Bertrand Russell. Second, as regards population, if there is not to be a permanent and increasing shortage of food, agriculture must be conducted by methods which are not wasteful of soil. An, in an increase in population must not outrun the increase in food production rendered possible by technical improvements. At present, neither condition is fulfilled. The population of the world is increasing and its capacity for food production is diminishing. Such a state of affairs obviously cannot continue very long without producing a cataclysm. Now, of course, that is all nonsense. And then we can go back even further to the 1700s, where the precursor of John Stuart Mill was uh, Malthus, who also was an economist for the British East India Company, who did, dealt with the very same nonsense uh, and was always shouting, uh, 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 fear, 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 about no food, and the population is just uh, going out of proportions. And he printed his book on population control, uh, this is Malthus, uh, two years before the British uh, did its first census. So he even quoted fake figures for his book, because it hadn't been done yet, the census, that is. Um, back to the impact of science on society by Bertrand Russell. To deal with this problem, it will be necessary to find ways of preventing an increase in world population. If this is to be done otherwise than the wars, pestilences and famines, it will demand a powerful international authority. My God, we hear the same thing over and over, eh? This authority should deal out the world's food to the various nations in proportion to their population at the time of the establishment of the authority. If any nation subsequently increases its population, it should not on that account receive any more food. The motive for not increasing population would therefore be very compelling. What method of preventing an increase might be preferred should be left to each state to decide. Now, each state is each country. Um, it's interesting that this written in the 1950s became
became a part of Agenda 21, pretty well word for word, which tells you this is an old plan run by the same people, the same elite group down through the ages. Uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, and I'll try and find it here, and this is all off the cuff pretty well, by the way, nothing's rehearsed here. Um, uh, okay, he, he goes on in uh, page 116 of the impact of science on society. He said, um, are mere members too, so important that for their sake we should patiently permit such a state of affairs to come about? Surely not. What then can we do? Apart from certain deep-seated prejudices, the answer would be obvious. The nations which at present increase rapidly should be encouraged to adopt the methods by which the West, in the West, the increase of population has been checked. The increase of population has been checked. Now remember that statement there. Now how did they check the population increase in the West? Uh, because it was at that time in the 1800s, right through, they started inoculations. And if you follow the, the statistics of the British, British Medical Association, who did careful follow-ups on all those who got inoculated, everybody who was inoculated against these particular diseases died of them. That's how they checked the population increase. I'll go on here. Educational propaganda with government help could achieve this result in a generation. There are, however, two powerful forces opposed to such policy, one is religion, the other is nationalism. I think it is the duty of all who are capable of facing facts to realize and to proclaim that opposition to the spread of birth control, if successful, must inflict upon mankind the most appalling depth of misery and degradation, and that within another 50 years or so. So he was predicting here that um, by the year 2000, we'd be walking all over each other, and crawling over each other to get to work. That's if there was any work left. He says, I do not pretend that work, birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. There are others which must, one must suppose opponents of birth control would prefer. War, as I remarked a moment ago, has hitherto been dis disappointing in this respect. Now, I repeat that for the hard of thinking. War, as I remarked a moment ago, has hitherto been disappointing in this respect. So he's admitting that they used war to kill off the people. And if you look at the history of Britain since the Rothschilds took over, there's been one war after another. So they're, they're very disappointed and killed enough off, you see. It says, if a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. Well, there's a nice statement to make, isn't it? If a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could pre uh, procreate freely without making the world too full. There would be nothing in this to offend the consciousness, the consciences of the devout, or to restrain the ambitions of nationalists. The state of affairs might be somewhat unpleasant, but what of that? Really high-minded people are indifferent to happiness. I'll repeat that part. Really high-minded people, he's talking about himself and his own class, you see, are indifferent to happiness, especially other people. However, I am wandering from the, the question of stability to which I must return. There are three ways of securing a society that shall be stable as regards population. The first is that of birth control, the second that of infanticide or really destructive wars, and the third that of, of general misery except for a powerful minority. Well, he's in the powerful minority group, so he can suggest this. All these methods have been practiced. The first, for example, by the Australian Aborigines. The second by the Aztecs. The Spartans and the rulers of Plato's Republic. The third in the world, as some Western internationalists hope to make it, and in the Soviet Russia. It is not to be supposed that Indians and Chinese like starving but they have to endure it because the armaments of the West are too strong for them. They hadn't built up China, of course, to be the manufacturer of the world by then. That wasn't his department. But these three, only birth control controls, uh, birth controls avoid extreme cruelty and unhappiness for the majority of human beings. Meanwhile, so long as there's not a single world government, he's always repeating that thing again, there will be competition for power amongst the different nations. 
And as increase of population brings the threat of famine, national power will become more and more obviously the only way to avoid starvation. There will, there will therefore be blocks in which the hungry nations band together are against those that are well fed. This is the explanation of the victory of communism in China. Now, it's interesting that Bertrand Russell, Lord Bertrand Russell, um, who talks about uh, the victory of communism in China, he went over to China in the 1920s. Um, it wasn't the, 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 the Soviets who went over to train the Chinese in, in communism. Bertrand Russell was sent from England to do it. And he taught in universities basic theories in communism to the, to the very young. Uh, those young students became the first leaders of the communist parties um, and throughout China. So once again, we have the, the central hub, London, and the aristocracy um, running both sides of the fence here, capitalism and communism, because between the two of them, they would terrorize the world and going the third way, which is the compromise between the two which is a small dominant elite who would then rule over the minds of the people who would be run in a communistic fashion by layers and layers and layers of, of bureaucracies. Uh, this is the fasci coming together, you see, with, with the sickle and the hammer of communism. This is the third way. Uh, this, is, this is it.